My name is Joy Tickle, a Tissue Viability Specialist from Shropshire. Today we will be focusing on how best practice can help us treat wound infection. The seminar is supported by BSM Medical and contact information is available at the end of the presentation. At any time during the seminar you can submit a question by commenting on the video or by emailing live at jcn.co.uk and I will do my best to answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the presentation. We'll now move on to the presentation entitled Using Best Practice to Treat Wound Infection. Time to go green. Tonight's learning objectives are around wound infection, of course, but we're going to address the impact of wound infection, look at what wound infection is and how it can develop, and address the impact on wound infection and biofilm formation and the impact on wound healing. We're going to address the signs and symptoms of wound infection and any complications that can present and then address the holistic management of wound infection with our patient journey. The impact of infected wounds is enormous. It's enormous not just to healthcare providers, it has a huge economical burden. The impact on acute wound, wound infections means on average 11 day extra stay in hospital and that can account for approximately £5,800 per patient. On practitioners, I myself am a practitioner as are you and the huge impact of caring for a patient with an infected wound is enormous, not only on resources, but on time. But most importantly to me is that major impact of wound infections on our patients, how debilitating those wound infections can be, increasing pain, discomfort, embarrassment due to leaking of wounds, exuding wounds, loss of femininity, muscularity, social isolation. It has a devastating effect on our patients. We know that all wounds, whether acute or chronic, are contaminated with microorganisms. That can be from the environment or from the patient, such as bodily fluids or just poor hand hygiene. And we know that by a burden, there are different levels. Here you can see the stages in wound infection continuum, from colonisation of a wound, where majority of our wounds will be colonised, all of our wounds will be colonised with microorganisms. They don't normally cause a problem to the patient or to the wound healing. However, when that bacteria or microorganisms increase in number, in virulence or in type, and when they start to impact on the patient's immune system, then, then they will move along, as you can see, this wound infection, infection continuum towards spreading and systemic infection. As I've said, wound contamination does occur. Surface organisms will attach to tissue and they will multiply, and that's known as colonisation. And normally that bacterial balance remains fairly established. It doesn't normally become a problem. However, colonisation can open the way for wounds to become infected. So the organisms begin to invade the tissues and they trigger an, an immune response within the patient. And this is when they can start to become problematical. Here you can see on the picture with the colonised wound, we have this nice granulation tissue. The wound is moving along the healing continuum. There is a multiplication of bacteria in there if we were to examine that, but it's not causing a problem. It's not resulting in an immune response or trigger. So really there are no clinical signs and symptoms of infection and the patient or the host remains well. On the other spectrum is your local infection. Here you can see a wound with erythema and redness and this is where the multiplication of the microorganisms are now causing a, a systemic or patient reaction. They're multiplying, they're overwhelming the wound and they're beginning to uh, individually cause that immune response in the patients. And we will start to see those local clinical signs and symptoms of infection. But spreading infection, this is when it becomes extremely problematical and extremely life-threatening. This is where the invasion of the surrounding tissue, not just the wound, it's the tissue surrounding the wound, is invaded by the uh, organisms. They've spread now, they've spread from the wound and they're proliferating or multiplying. And these will give significant signs and symptoms extending beyond the wound bed itself. It may also involve, of course, deeper tissue. So that might be underlying muscle, tendon, fascia, organs, or even into body cavities. Systemic infection, this is the one that we're most fearful of. Systemic infection spreads from a wound and it affects the whole body, the whole person. 
This microorganism spread throughout the vascular or lymphatic systems or both, and it causes then a systemic infl inflammatory response. We can start to see significant signs and symptoms within our patients, even um, organ failure and possible sepsis and unfortunately death. But along with this multiplication of microorganisms within our wounds, um, and by, uh, by mentioning microorganisms, it's not just bacteria, it's fungi and viral um, microorganisms as well that are problematical in wounds. We have an additional problem. We have a problem with the formation of biofilms. Now, I could talk for another hour about biofilms, as most of you probably are aware. However, I'm going to try and explain to you in just a few minutes of how biofilms affect wound healing and wound infection. We all have planktonic free-floating bacteria, and that bacteria can, it can attach itself to the collagen in a wound bed. And normally, our own immune system can kill most of that planktonic bacteria. However, once that, some of that bacteria remains, and it begins to multiply. And particularly in some chronic wounds, in, in chronic wounds, sorry, and infected wounds, they start to become encased with a very strong extracellular ca uh, case around them. Uh, well, I can't go into all the scientific details behind that, but if you imagine these bacterial microorganisms are now becoming encased in a very strong uh, outer casing, okay? They can then go on to mature. They become more mature biofilms and can then disperse. So how can they affect wound healing? Well, what I want to bring your attention to is they can attach to, um, to the uh, wound beds, uh, to the tissue within minutes. And those micro colonies that you saw on that diagram can attach then and form in two to four hours. We then get that extracellular polymeric substance, which I told you about, which will encase that bacteria, okay? And that will develop within about six to 12 hours and become really robust and really tough. And within two to four days, we have what we call a mature biofilm colony that's, that's evolved. And following on from that, if we do disrupt that biofilm colony, which I'm going to tell you how we can manage biofilms, if we do disrupt it, it can reform within 24 hours. So what is the impact of these biofilms then? It increases an imbalance of certain protease inhibitors, okay? And what they, they can do is destroy those essential proteins our body's trying to produce to allow a wound to heal. It decreases the amount of, of growth factor receptors within the wound bed. So again, it's impeding, impacting on the wound healing. We get a reduction in the cell proliferation or cell multiplication and also not just the production of the cells, but the migration of those cells across the wound surface, surface. And if we didn't have that cell migration or cell migration to the source of injury, you can imagine how that will impede wound healing or, or, or may cause further uh, wound uh, deterioration. And acute wounds can very easily progress to being chronic wounds as you're aware of that. So overall, it causes significant delayed healing a chronic inflammatory phase, which then leads to increased exudate volumes. And guess what? When we have increased exudate volumes, increased inflammation, there is a risk then of increased micro, microorganisms developing in that site. So local signs and symptoms of wound infection, and I'm going to talk to you towards the end how we can eradicate or certainly uh, break down that extracellular matrix and prevent biofilm reformation. And I'll talk to you that uh, when we talk about the management of infection. But let's move on to then our next objective, which is looking at the signs and symptoms. So we've talked about the different types of infection along the infection continuum. We've talked about the impact, but what are the local signs and symptoms? I'm probably talking to most of you out there that know these signs and symptoms, but I really think it's important that we, over, over, we don't overlook them. Local infection, there can be some subtle, subtle signs or covert signs. We get that very, you might see that red granular tissue, but it's very friable. It can easily bleed. Um, 
we may see increased or smell or have increased smell odour and the main person that will tell you that is your patient or certainly your patient's family or carer and that's the most distressing to the patient as well. The patient may be reporting a new type of pain or a different type of pain or a different location of the pain or change in sensation. So it's really important that that pain or uh, discomfort is assessed every time um, we meet our patients listen to them they can tell you if there's a lot of subtle changes that are happening in their wound we might see some pocketing or some undermining of the wound edge itself that hasn't been present before that can be a local sign of infection and certainly we may have set our objectives hopefully we will have as, as recommended with best practice between you yourself and the patient you'll set some objectives of that wound healing you will set some dates about what expectations are but you see that that delayed wound, wound healing is occurring beyond that, that date of expectation. You may then, as I have already said, have further wound break, breakdown or new ulcerations or wounds forming as a, a result of that local infection. And of course, those classic overt signs are erythema, that redness, local warmth, swelling, purulent discharge and let's not forget that edge date may not change in volume it may change in viscosity so you go to that more thicker edge date in consistency which is a really classic indica indicator that the amount of uh, microorganisms in the edge date is increasing okay which means it's increasing in the wound bed um, so you know be aware of just the viscosity as well delay wound healing as i said and those other factors linked to the patient but with spreading infection, you will see more. You will see it extending in uh, duration um, of the infection for so the period, but also duration of spreading along tissue planes or along the limb or where the wound is located. You may see increased erythema. You may see some crepitus, and that's where you can actually, um, by pressing the tissue or the skin around an infected wound with spreading infection, you can almost ear that the air within those tissues itself. You might see further wound breakdown or deistence or the wounds may become deeper um, and, and unfortunately that can happen. But from your patient's perspective, they might report that they feel quite lethargic, um, they're not eating and drinking as well, they feel quite tired. Some of my patients report that sometimes they feel like they've got the flu and it's that general uh, lethargy um, that alerts me that there may be some signs of spreading infection. But what we mustn't forget is those patients who may mask the signs and symptoms, those classic signs and symptoms of wound infection. So sometimes your immunosuppressed patients or patients with uh, diabetes might mask some of these local signs and symptoms or certainly some of the other systemic signs and symptoms. So please bear that in mind with those patients at high risk. And finally, the systemic infection, which I hope none of us ever have to um, address with our patients, but unfortunately it does happen in wound infection when it begins to spread throughout the system, the patient's body, um, and it can lead to, as you are aware, uh, septic shock, so looking out for the signs of sepsis, um, organ failure and death. And if you do ever suspect any patients as any signs or symptoms of sep sepsis, it's, it's an immediate 999 response. So what about diagnosing this wound infection then? I know as healthcare professionals, we, we, take, we have to understand the risk factors and signs and symptoms of wound infection. But the only way we're going to do that is by looking at the patient, the patient's wound itself, so the risk factors associated with that, and the patient's environment, which I've worked in community for many, many years. And I think that's really important when we're talking about community care. And it's that early detection and timely treatment that is so imperative to stop that wound infection spreading. So it's very much based on your clinical assessment, your clinical judgment, and sometimes it is just that gut feeling and that clinical judgment that will help as well. But also listening to the patient and, and looking at any systemic inflammatory response. Diagnosing as well, again, I've just talked to you about the appropriate assessment of your patient, the wound and the environment, but it's also about appropriate use of system, systematic antibiotic therapy. So misdiagnosis of wound infection can obviously then lead to inappropriate use of antimicrobials, 
inappropriate use of antibiotic therapy. And again, when we then require these, these, the benefits of these treatments, you know, can be problematical. So again, it's making sure uh, that there is misdiagnosis as well. But in most cases in, of, of wound infection, you know, it's a multifactorial multifactorial and occurs when there's various risk factors that overwhelm the, the patient's defence. Do we swab or don't we swab? Investigations to diagnose wound infection. I think it's your clinical assessment myself, very much around the clinical assessment of what we've just talked about. But there are times then we have to, you know, undertake certain uh, microbiology tests, microbiological tests. One commonly that, that um, a lot of nurses and clinicians use is wound swabbing. And what that does is helps to establish uh, the pathogen or the strain or the type, okay? Confirm it, the amount, sensitivity um, of any treatments or antibiotic therapies, um, and identify any possible complications. But what I will emphasize is, please don't undertake wound swabbing just as analysis of wound specimens in the absence of any appropriate indication. So for instance, why am I taking this wound swab? Will it alter the treatment plan or antimicrobial uh, treatment plan I'm going to put in place? Is there any signs of spreading infection? Because, and if in doubt, talk to the team, talk to the MDT team, or even pick up the phone speak to the microbiologists you know they are extremely helpful when it comes to helping to prevent and manage wound infection if we don't treat or assess and, and eradicate some of the problems with wound infection of course it can lead to spreading as we've said cellulitis is a common uh, spread of, of wound infection or even more significant when it, it spreads to the bone um, and that's like your osteomyelitis and, and as I've said, I won't keep um, uh, mentioning this, but certainly the risk of septicemia. So we've talked about types of infection. We've talked about the risk factors. So we'll talk about now the holistic assessment of that wound effect infection um, and as you you've heard me say I do keep talking about that holistic assessment because it's not just an issue with the wound it's the patient and the care environment so it's essential that we look at not just the individual but the pathogen and trying to get the balance between the patient and the pathogen because as I've said there will always be microorganisms on a wound it's getting that balance so we need to optimize the patient's response we meet, need to optimize the patient's condition so they can equally fight any infection or prevent it. You know, antimicrobial dressings, antimicrobial pathways are very effective, but it's the patient themselves. It's the patient themselves that can help to prevent and treat wound infection. We need to reduce that number of those uh, microorganisms. As I've said, they'll always be present. What we want to do is reduce the number and stop them from multiplying if possible. And certainly that is by looking at optimising the wound uh, healing environment. What I will say is please always implement and follow your local infection control policies and procedures because that may vary. So let's look at those risk factors. I've already talked to you about some of these, particularly intrinsic with the patients. So malnutrition is a real big risk factor contributing to the risk of wound infection or infection per se. And I know that can be extremely difficult for some of our patients who, you know, where diet may be a problem or they may have some conditions that affect their absorption of nutrition. But again, work as a team, work as a multidisciplinary team to see how we can improve nutrition, but not, not, not just nutrition, hydration as well. Okay, it's really important that we have those fluids to assist as well. How can we address any underlying diseases that might affect the immune response? I've mentioned diabetes that might mimic those, mask those signs and symptoms of infection. So again, how can we get that really good uh, glycemic control? Again, we may not be able to do that on our own, but certainly with discussing with the patients about how these comorbidities or these diseases can affect their risk of uh, higher risk of infection, we can engage with them and get them on board that why we're talking to them about having effective uh, high, uh, glycemic control. And certainly age, uh, I'm afraid if, if age comes to us all, but with the elderly population, with the elderly patient, of course, the highest risk factors uh, with immunosuppressive diseases, comorbidities, polypharmacy, can put them at a higher intrinsic risk factor to infection. Certain extrinsic factors, 
we need to consider medication. The patient may be undergoing some treatment or medication that may affect their immunosuppressive response. So for instance, radiotherapy, chemotherapy. We can't stop that medication, we can't stop that treatment, but we're aware of the higher risk of that patient developing infection. Looking at the patient's environment or the, or the care environment, you know, and ensuring that it's clean and it's tidy. And for you community nurses, um, you know, I know that's not always easy. But again, addressing that with the patients or with the family or the carers to look how we can improve that. And looking at discussion with the patients about life, ch life choices. You know, as I said last week, it's the patient that heals the wound and it's the patient that can help to stop some of the risk factors for wound infection. So smoking, you know, weight loss, all of those factors putting some ownership back onto the patient, empowering the patient to take responsibility. So optimising that individual patient response is what I said, managing those comorbidities, eliminating those risk factors that might be increasing the risk of infection um, and optimising nutritional status and hydration. But also what we all need to address with the individual is manage other sites of infection because I've just talked to you about patients having multiple comorbidities, particularly patients, um, elderly patients. So for instance, they may have an infection, a urinary tract infection or a chest infection. So we really need to address that and be aware of that as well and manage that um, because that can put them at higher risk of, of developing the wound infection, of course, through cross-contamination, etc treat the patient's symptoms and I'm sure that goes without saying. You know yourselves a small cut that becomes infected is extremely painful, can make you feel extremely unwell. So we really need to treat their symptoms to help to support their psychosocial support as well. Patients in pain with a very ex exuding wound that is malodorous will be very reluctant to engage um, outside their home or certainly engage in a care care situation with other residents and it's really important that we address that as well and engaging with that patient in setting those personalised management plan and objectives and if those objectives aren't being met to reassess them and reset them um, and that's important too and eliminating any local factors within the wound area or the wound environment um, to minimise the contributors to wound infection. And by that, I mean any increased edudate or local moisture. It could even be something as simple as pressure or shear and friction on that wound. That is That constant pressure and shear and friction is then going to cause further damage to the skin um, and further hypoxia to the area potentially, which can make the microorganisms multiply. So even just simple things as pressure offloading and edema management and patients with edema is, is effective. And we need to get that balance, don't we? That, that environmental and general measures environments. Um, yes, we like to put, perform wound care in a clean environment. It's not always easy. So please, I respect that. But we try and perform that in a clean environment as possible. Um, let's assess and determine the appropriate aseptic and clean technique that's required. It may not always be possible to undertake an aseptic technique. Is it always necessary in chronic wounds if we're using a very good clean technique? You know, so you need to do that risk assessment. It will be individual for the patient, the wound and the environment you're caring for that patient in. And certainly storing appropriate, um, you know, dressings, etc. that you're using to try and reduce any contamination or cross-contamination. And certainly, you know, supporting your patients of why you're doing that, why you need a clean environment. Um, you're protecting the patient, but equally you're protecting yourself. And we can certainly reduce micro, micro uh, organisms in the wound. Um, and I think this is something we do do every day in practice. Um, and sometimes maybe we take it for a little bit for granted, but it's certainly we need to be aware that we are doing this um, in order to reduce the micro, uh, micro organisms. So preventing that cross infection, you know, really good standard universal approach uh, to clean techniques or aseptic techniques allow wound drainage. I find the biggest reasons why I see local infections and spreading infections is there's not effective wound drainage around that wound site or taking exudate away from the wound bed. Hence that then can cause problems with the peri wound skin, the bacterial, multi, the bacterial multiply, it will destroy 
healthy tissue and equally it can further deteriorate, uh, destroy the wound tissue as well. So managing that moisture, that peri-wound skin and that exudate. And most importantly, let's not forget good effective wound bed preparation. Because if you prepare the wound bed well and optimise the wound bed, you straight away will reduce the bacterial burden to that wound bed. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Serious, as well as pre uh, preparing the wound bed, that comes in with not only reducing the microorganisms, it helps you to break down that biofilm and stop its reformation. And remember, I'm going to take you back to that. Remember what I said about that really hard casing around that bacteria that is now protected. So your natural antibodies, you might use an antimicrobial dressing, you may do a, use an antiseptic cleansing agent, cannot penetrate that really strong extracellular matrix around those organisms. So how do, how do we treat that? So this morning, all of you, or maybe later on tonight, woke up and you all had a biofilm. And you all had a biofilm in your mouth. So I know you're all sitting at home now doing this. Okay. You did have a biofilm. So I'll ask you the question. So you had bacteria on your uh, organisms, on your teeth and your gums and your tongue. They're encased in this really hard shell. Did you put your toothpaste that's antimicrobial, anti -wi uh, that's whitening, just onto your teeth? Hopefully you didn't, okay? You then got a toothbrush and you used the toothbrush to brush your teeth and your gums and your tongue and everywhere else because your dentist told you. Not because in your head you're probably thinking, I'm going to disrupt the biofilms and I'm going to disrupt that really hard casing. But that's what you're doing. With that brush, you are debriding, you are breaking the case so that your nice toothpaste that's antibacterial and whitening can penetrate. It now can penetrate and destroy or hinder the bacteria. So it makes sense. But this evening, so you did that this morning, and this evening you'll go to bed. And guess what? The biofilms have reformed. Remember the, 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 the analogy of the time factors? So you will rebrush your teeth. And it's the same for wounds. That wound debridement and cleansing is ongoing. Even if you think you can't, you know, because you can't visualize biofilms in all wounds. So you've got to think of the analogy. Disrupt that case, break it down. Then the antimicrobial dressings that you will be using or the treatments that you're using can, can start to do their job. Your pac patient's antibodies and its own system can start to do its job. So that's what takes me to wound bed preparation, or TIME. TIME is an acronym, and it talks about removing the barriers to wound, heal, wound healing. T is for tissue, I is for infection or inflammation, M is moisture, and E is edge. It's an acronym that there's lots of organisations that use it. We certainly do. But again, it's an aid. It helps clinicians to aid making decisions. Making decisions how they're going to remove the barriers. If you address all of those factors, the tissue, potential infection or biofilms, the moisture levels and the edge of the wound, I will guarantee you, you will move that wound along the healing continuum because you're move, removing some of the barriers. So think about that, think about that acronym, you know, or a similar acronym that you can use to aid clinicians in that decision making. And what we're looking at there is really good, as I've said, wound cleansing, disrupting those biofilms, removing that devitalised tissue. And today's presentation won't, you know, time won't allow me to go into all of that. But just remember, you can read further about this and think about removing those barriers. How do we manage that wound infection then? So we've diagnosed it. We need to manage it. And as I've just said, we need to manage it to help to uh, prevent further deterioration. OK, but we also need to promote wound healing. OK, treatment of an infected wound should be clear and follow a decisive treatment plan. And you may have different pathways in where you work. You may have an antimicrobial pathway along with a, a debridement pathway or a biofilm pathway and a wound bed preparation pathway. They're really valuable. Use them. If you don't have them, by all means, share on, on you know, through tonight. We can share any good evidence of good practice with you later on. But let's address the comorbidities of the patient, and that will take a multidisciplinary team approach. It won't be just down to the clinician caring for the patient's wound. Also, what we need to do is think about using some antimicrobial 
um, or anti, uh, antiseptic properties, but know how they use, and I'll talk to you a little bit, uh, how they work, sorry, and when and where to use them. And post-debridement, think about what I've just said with your biofilms. If you only remember the teeth analogy, how you can break down those biofilms and make those topical treatments more effective so that we're not using antimicrobials long term. Because I'm, I'm sure you hear this, I hear clinicians who say to me, oh, we've used that antimicrobial for weeks and it's not doing anything. So I, my question is, well, how are you preparing the wound bed? How are you debriding the wound bed? because I'll guarantee it's probably not the antimicrobial that's ineffective, it's the wound bed preparation. So antimicrobial agents um, very commonly um, are uh, antimicrobial agents within a dressing. Um, often uh, they have different ways or abilities to either kill or control the growth of those microorganisms, so it's important you know how they work, but they are very effective. The selection of that antimicrobial dressing should be based upon that whole assessment, okay, um, but primary objective of optimising the wound bed, of course, okay. What, with the ever-growing prevalence of antibiotic resistance, what I will say, the role of antimicrobial dressings is really paramount now. Um, you know, the, the, it's the prevalence of antibio antibiotic resistance organisms, organisms is on the enormous increase. Um, so we really, you know, the role of antimicrobials, antiseptics is really important here. When choosing your antimicrobial agents, just have a look at various factors. I can't go through them all tonight, but know how the antimicrobial, how it works, what's the agent within it to inhibit or kill the bacteria, um, the amount of the agent available in the dressing, any contraindications is also important. Can that dressing conform to the wound? So it's, if, if the dressing can't conform or come in contact with the wound bed itself, is it going to be really effective as an antimicrobial if it can't donate or lie in contact with that bacteria? How long can you use it or how long do you leave the dressing in place? I think that's important because very much we're given guidance, oh yes, this dressing can be left in place for seven days. Please just use your own clinical assessment, holistic assessment. If entry dates are high, you cannot leave that dressing in place for seven days. That, that's my, my clinical experience okay so if if addressing antimicrobial can be left in place for seven days that's fine as long as the whole clinical assessment deems that is suitable um, and again how does the agent work how how effective is it how long do you use it for and length of use takes me on to what i call the two-week challenge and it's certainly something we we keen to to roll out of course, assessment is ongoing. Wound assessment, as we talked about last week, is regular. Reassessment, re-evaluation, not just of the wound, of the treatment itself. What I will say is remember the two-week challenge with a topical antimicrobial or, or antiseptic, because normally two weeks is sufficient time for that agent to exert a beneficial activity. If it's not, then stop. Stop and think and reassess. What is my wound bed preparation in place for this patient and this patient's wound? If, again, that ticks the boxes, then you may change the type of antimicrobial. You will rethink your objectives, you may discuss as a team, and you'll certainly be discussing with the patient. But also be thinking about not just the antimicrobial in use, the full wound bed preparation and patient assessment as well. Antibiotic therapy can be a bone of contention. But I will agree with, every, with all of the uh, literature around antibiotic use. It sh alone, it should not be used routinely for the promotion of wound healing. You know, it's got to be reserved for wounds that we know are confirmed by clinical signs and symptoms or confirmation by a microbiologist that we need to treat. Again, not just because of antibiotic resistance. You know, if any of you have ever taken antibiotics yourself, it can have a massive impact on the patient's well-being. It can interact with other medications the patients may be taking. So again, addressing not just the factors around resistance. So we've got to be uh, um, really careful when prescribing antibiotics and have a clear rationale of why. So are the signs and symptoms? Yes, I agree. There are some patients who, through wider teamwork, are put on therapeutic doses of antibiotic therapy. But that's normally with an underlying condition or a deep-seated infection. That's not the case for just general wound infections. So remember, systemic antibiotics should be re reserved um, for use only when the degree of infection is unable to be controlled.
And finally, that regular and consistent re reassessment and reevaluation. So I think it's important we call that reevaluation as well, based on any result. You know, so is the patient is the patient signs and symptoms revolving, resolving? Is the patient's general condition improving? So there's various uh, open triggered questions as the patient's pain decreased, and that's normally a good indicator. Certainly for me, as I've used that exudate volume lessened or the viscosity become a little bit more thin. Is the malodor resolving? All these factors can say whether or not we, you know, the, the uh, resolving signs and symptoms of the infection. Consistent and regular documentation. Photography is great. It doesn't always indicate infection, but certainly can show those uh, that erythema or that spreading infection or the wound bed itself. Monitoring the peri wound condition if that starts to break down. Addressed if that's because the infection is not being addressed. Um, and again, symptoms relating to the patient. So I want to share with you, I want to share with you three patient journeys um, because it's all well and good we talk about wound assessment and infection assessment but at the end of the day we're dealing with a patient who is suffering. Um, this is a lady who presented with a venous leg ulcer. She would had this venous leg ulcer for two and a half years. So straight away on assessment we we're already thinking the cause was venous disease. She had lipodermatosclerosis and various other skin changes associated with that. Equally, she had a very uh, extensive wound that was extremely painful. She had no other underlying comorbidities that made us think about any further risk factors about infection. But this was a locally infected wound. It was extremely painful. It was very malodorous. Exudate levels had increased, and so with the viscosity of the exudate, it had become very purulent as well. And you can imagine the impact on this lady's life for the fact that she was wearing uh, towels around her leg because it was licking. She was embarrassed because of her footwear or she couldn't get footwear on, which reduced her mobility and ability to go outdoors and certainly affected the way she felt as a lady. The wound bed itself, as you can see, uh, the signs and symptoms of infection there with the erythema. There is that granular tissue, but was very friable. Um, and it was following um, the introduction of looking at a new antimicrobial, Cutamed Sorbac, that we decided to look at wound bed preparation for her and using a new antimicrobial. So we prepared the wound bed, we did regular debridement with monofilament pads, we did wound cleansing and we used the, the uh, Cutamed Sorbac on the wound bed itself. Now, as you can see in the other picture, this was only two weeks, so remember the two week rule. So following two weeks of treatment, the wound had certainly not deteriorated. The patient's symptoms were resolving. She'd become less, there was less pain, certainly less exudate, um, and certainly it was more comfortable. But most importantly, even though there is still slough present, the, f the granular tissue that was present was healthy granular tissue. Um, we then chose and we reassessed and set new objectives. We continued the wound bed preparation um, again, because of the chronicity of the wound and there was still some local infection in there. And we continued the antimicrobial therapy for another two weeks. But bear in mind that came hand in hand with the removal of the biofilms and the good debridement. And this went on very successfully to heal. Our second patient, slightly different. So this lady presented with a significant ulcer. And this lady had had this present for over five years. She was a patient who had quite debilitating comorbidities in the sense that she had haematological condition that really affected her immunosuppressive. Um, it was very much around an immunosuppressive disease. So her ability to fight infection was already uh, reduced. She had had frequent infections. She'd had frequent antibiotic therapy. Um, she had no venous disease, but you can see she had noticeable edema to that wound, which caused her significant problems with uh, exudate. But she had an infection. She had an infection that was beginning to make her feel unwell. So you can see there's not necessarily any spreading signs there, but the wound bed itself was deteriorating. And it was the lady's signs and symptoms that she presented to us that told us that this wound was infected. And equally, because this lady who's immunosuppressed, again, the higher risk factors there. Again, we address the wound bed preparation with effective cleansing, um, and we introduced, um, you know, the antimicrobial uh, dressing the cutamed sorbate. And 
you can see the significant um, improvement in removal of the devitalised tissue, redu reduction of the microorganisms, there'll always be microorganisms in there, but by that really good pathway, um, how then we moved on to some nice granulation tissue, the wound as you can see is reducing in size, which something for this lady hadn't happened for many years. Um, already, you know, her self-esteem was improved, uh, exudates were less, she was in less pain, um, and just for her, the fact that, you know, we all assume our patient's first objective is to heal a wound, but actually, our, mostly our patient's objectives are to stop some of the signs and symptoms, and for this lady, it was pain, smell, and leaking, um, and so she was very pleased. And finally, the, the other patient journey is a patient who presented with an inflammatory disease, um, systemic inflammatory disease called vasculitis, and that was secondary to a drug reaction for, from some medication he was taking. He was a young gentleman, electrician married with two children who had this inflammatory response which caused significant uh, ulceration to his lower limb extremely painful if any of you have ever nursed anybody with a vasculitic ulcer it's extremely painful very debilitating and can be very life-threatening the patient was admitted due to uncontrolled pain um, to hospital and you can see the wound bed the devitalized wound bed um, but also because of this immunosuppressive response the, the the patient was becoming unwell and unwell because of the the systemic infection we needed to prepare that wound bed really quickly um, so relying on autolytic debridement such as your wound dressings which we do very much so we we had to rely equally on some sharp debridement so we we removed the devitalized tissue uh, with sharp tools and really good wound bed cleansing and again decutimedsorb backed antimicrobial and you can see just literally that combination of, of the treatment regime after just two weeks the most important thing for this gentleman was he could return home. He could return home and try and take part in his family life, which he found very restricting, of course, when he's in hospital. He was very worried about employment. He was self-employed, but the, you can understand the financial impact on him um, as, as, as a father and a husband. But by improving that overall and reducing those risk factors of infection, it means we can try and heal this wound a lot more quickly with the patient, of course, because the patient's body and we can optimise his underlying conditions to assist that wound into heal, which it did and went on to. So that was my experience, that was our experience uh, on our patient journey with the Cutimed Sorbat range. And, you know, I'm not going to stand and talk about all of it. I, I will say, you know, it's very effective, um, not just at removing bacteria, but fungi. Remember what I said, it isn't just bacteria, it's all microorganisms that we need to tackle in a wound um, and not just bacteria itself. Um, you know, it works in, in, in a nutshell. Um, it's hydrophobic, so what it does is allows the dressing um, to bind with the, well the bacteria and fungi binds with the dressing and we remove that bacteria from from the wound bed but what I will say is please go on you know go onto the BSM website find out a little bit more about it that isn't you know uh, you know in time for us tonight the main impact was talking around wound, ass wound assessment and management so in summary infection occurs uh, when the multiplication of bacterial microorganisms overwhelms our body or our, bo our patient's body immune system. And that then can cause significant damage and deterioration to the wound and the peri-wound skin. We, we've seen it can soon spread, it can lead to further complications. So that early diagnosis and management and prevention, let's not forget prevention, is so vital to avoid those complications. We, we have to be mindful of the signs and symptoms, but also let our patients know what are the signs and symptoms, let our patients, carers or family know what are those signs and symptoms of infection, so we can have that really early alert to prevent that infection, spreading or even forming in the first place um, and remember those patients where those signs and symptoms might be more subtle and let's not forget that wound buyer burden you know those biofilms ensuring a really effective debridement pathway and biofilm pathway there's many out there that can really help you in practice and we have to understand how they work and have to understand how antiseptics and antimicrobials work in order to us to, to deliver a really clinically cost-effective treatment for our patients
That constant and consistent patient and wound reassessment is really effective as well for prevention and management of wound infection. And I know it's difficult out there. I know it's difficult sometimes we don't always see the same patient. So that's why our tools and our pathways and our documentation all have to be consistent and our assessment techniques have to be consistent. Um, and as I've said, you know, using the new antimicrobials can prove a really suitable and safe way to prevent wound infection. If you do require some further free education and training, um, because this is only an hour's presentation tonight, along with some questions, there's lots of mod modules you can uh, go on to via the BSN website. Some of those are, are infection management, uh, factors affecting wound healing. So, you know, do, do, do log on. Maybe not tonight, you might be too tired, but certainly log on and use these as valuable, valuable uh, educational resources uh, to further, further your knowledge. So now we'll move on to our real time and question and answer session. Moving on to our first question. With spreading infection, would you recommend using both topical antimicrobials and also antibiotics? Um, I would say if it's spreading and there are signs and symptoms obviously with the patient, then I would use both. But I'd be doing that in conjunction with speaking to, you know, the medical team or, I mean, I'm an independent nurse prescriber, so I would probably take um, advice, you know, maybe from the microbiologist or I'll just use my own clinical assessment skills uh, to prescribe an antibiotic. But I certainly would use both if it's spreading. But what I would do if it's spreading, I would be taking that wound swab. If, if you can, rather than just a swab and, and look at the techniques you, you're advised to use, I would be taking a little bit, maybe trying to get a little bit of the, uh, the sorry, the tissue, because with the wound swab, you, you really want the cleanest part of the wound, not the sloughiest part of the wound. But again, that's taking you back to your local policy. Um, but I would certainly wouldn't just prescribe the antibiotics and a topical antimicrobial without trying to establish what microorganisms, what amounts, what virulence, on what can work against the, work against them, and certainly it's times like that I would be speaking to my microbiologist as well. If you have a patient with cellulitis, should you stop compression? Now, this was something that I was involved with uh, colleagues of mine about best practice statement for the management of venous leg ulcers. And we looked at myths and truths around um, the management of venous leg ulcers and compression and things. And one of, the, one of the myths came around, you have to stop compression if somebody has cellulitis. The, the evidence suggests that actually, don't stop compression therapy if the patient has cellulitis. However, if it's too uncomfortable, then yes, stop it until it's resolving or the pain is under control, then recommence it. Because a lot of the problems associated with cellulitis will be swelling to the tissue, inflammation in the tissue, inflammation in the limb. If we can reduce the swelling, the inflammation, i.e. with compression, then guess what? We're going to resolve that problem even quicker. But I do appreciate it's an extremely painful condition, but if you can, continue using, but if you need to, stop, but reassess and when suitable, compress the limb. Um, obviously, bearing in mind the patient's had that full holistic assessment and ABPI to ensure it's safe to compress the limb. So here's another one. This, you know, this is the testing time for me. I've used topical antimicrobials when the wound was presented as a local infection, but the patient still went on to get a spreading infection. What could the reason be? Gosh, well, there could be a few reasons. So let's start at the beginning. So you've been using an antimicrobial because there was some local infection, but unfortunately the patient went on and got the spreading infection. A couple of things I would be thinking about. Certainly I would go back to the beginning and reassess the patient. Is, is there something we might be missing on the holistic assessment of the patient? So, you know, they may not present with any comorbidities, but I would be checking that, yeah, do some bloods. Are they diabetic? Are they anemic? Is there a reason why that infection? So that might be from a patient perspective. So I'm going to try and take each individual aspect. Environmental issue, I might be looking at the environment that patient's being cared for. Um, is there an issue there? that might be causing that local infection to spread. Looking at the patient, are there any other infections that might be present that, that might be uh, impeding? Sometimes just general, the patient being generally unwell. I very frequently, if I see a patient with a wound infection that's spreading, ask about other illnesses. Have you been unwell recently? 
yeah, I had a little bit of a, you know, a vomiting bug. So straight away I'm thinking, well, they won't have, you know, certainly they would have felt up poorly. They probably wouldn't have been eating. They probably wouldn't have been taking much fluid. So straight away, their, their ability to fight infection or prevent infection from spreading is already compromised. So I'll ask about the patient and then I'll look at the wound itself and I will look if there are any factors. So, for instance, am I preparing that wound bed? Am I breaking down that biofilm? Because I'm using a very good antimicrobial, but it's spreading. So can that antimicrobial actually penetrate and do its work effectively? So those are the sorts of things, and I'd be more than happy to discuss that because I think that could take a good, you know, 15 minutes to really get in the nitty gritty of that. But yeah, those are some of the, 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 the first factors I'd be thinking about. So another question, I found nurses swab wounds differently. Aye, some clean the wound first, then swab. Others swab before cleaning, which is the correct way and has best practice changed to when you should swab a wound. I, I have gone very much off the um, um, International uh, Wound Infection Institute, their latest guidance 2016. And that talks about the Levine technique of wound swabbing. So it talks about really cleansing the wound first um, and using a technique. And again, I can't go into the whole details, but please look into to, to that document. It's a best, best practice document, best recommendations. But it does talk about cleaning the wound before because what you don't want on your wound swab is any um, residue, residue dressing. You really want to get to the bacteria or the microorganisms that are in there. Um, so that's the, that's the policy, that's the guidance I follow. You must you know, talk with your, with your microbiologist in, in your area, but I would say that's a really good guidance. And that did change our practice somewhat a little bit by just looking at the latest evidence. Um, and swabbing, I only swab a wound if I feel um, that I've implemented a treatment and it's not responding. And I feel that it's not just the treatment, I've got really effective wound bed preparation, really good wound management, antimicrobials, and the wound is not responding, then I would, I would swab. But equally, I would try and uh, speak to the micro microbiologist and, and maybe get a little bit of the tissue. I know that's not always feasible, but certainly from swabbing, those are the criteria. If the patient's becoming unwell, the wound itself may not have deteriorated, but you're seeing symptoms within the patients, then I would swab. Okay, so just make sure your rationale for swabbing is clear. Okay, and your objectives, you know, so if a patient, certainly if a patient and a wound is not responding and you know re by reassessing the patient and the wound that there's a really good management plan in there, then yes, I would swab. After the two week challenge with a topical antimicrobial, if it hasn't worked, what would you recommend doing? That's a really, really good question. If at two weeks you reevaluate and you reassess the wound and that topical antimicrobial is not working, I still go back, and I know I keep saying it, but I still go back to my wound bed preparation. Is it effective? Is it robust enough? Thinking of the toothbrush analogy. Am I debriding effectively? Um, you know, etc. If that's yes, I'll change the type of antimicrobial. There's no real research to suggest this, but there is some anecdotal evidence coming out about what we call alternating your antimicrobial or um, changing it if it's not effective. Again, it's around about potentially the wound uh, my, um, microorganisms not being responsive to that antimicrobial. But I would, I would, if everything else was, um, if, you know, clinically evident, the wound bed, etc. I would probably, and there was no other factors uh, saying why that wound uh, antimicrobial shouldn't be working. I would probably switch to a different antimicrobial. I'm thinking of writing an infection pathway, brilliant idea. Any advice? Would you split it into treatment for localised infection and treatment for spreading? Yes, I would. Um, and I think what I will say to you, brilliant idea if you haven't got an infection pathway. But you know what? There's a lot of people out there who gladly support you. I'm one of them. We've just introduced um, introducing a, an infection pathway and an antimicrobial pathway and a biofilm pathway. Don't reinvent the wheel. There's lots of evidence out there. There's lots of clinicians, and I'm sure some of you now are bouncing ideas to each other. Um, but I would definitely split them, you know, and look at those criteria of localised systemic spreading and treatment regimes. Some will overlap. Some will overlap. But again, I give you. It's making it easy for a clinician to make decisions, and that doesn't mean because they can't. It's just how busy we are. We've got to just make it so 
aid their decision making, make it quite clear of the treatment pathway. How often would you change a dressing with an infection and the patient is in compression? Again, there's no right and wrong answer. What I will say, if there's an infection, I will increase the amount of dressing changes. Okay, um, one, because of breaking down and removing the, the um, edge date slough biofilms, okay, because be, it will be more evident. Chances are, if there's an infection, edge date levels will increase. Okay, so where you might have seen that patient twice a week because exudate levels were moderate and viscosity was quite thin, in an infection you will probably definitely see that the exudate will increase, the viscosity will increase, and I would guarantee that the chances are you would have to increase because if we don't maintain that moisture balance and reduce uh, you know, high levels of exudate, the bacteria is going to proliferate and the microorganisms are going to multiply even more. You're testing me tonight. How do you manage the high edge dates from leg ulcers in compression? Do you pad it after applying the compression bandage or before? If you've got high edge date levels and the patient's in compression, I'm going to take you back to the best practice statement of uh, best practice um, holistic management of venous leg ulcers. You apply, if it's heavily exuding, you want a super absorbent dressing underneath the compression bandage. It will not interfere with the sub bandage pressure. If you put padding on the outside of the compression bandaging or, or hosiery, all that's going to happen is that exudate and, and the fluid is going to sit on the wound bed or the peri wound skin or within the bandage and it's going to cause more damage and more bacterial multiplication. So you're far better putting the uh, super absorbent if it's highly exuding. If it's just moderate, you can just use a simple absorbent pad underneath the compression. In the past, I've heard people talk about cri critical colonisation. Where does this fit in? Yeah, we used to use that terminology, critical colonisation. Um, and it, it was only by looking at evidence and the, what I've just mentioned uh, about the Institute for Wound Infection. Um, they, have, they stopped critical colonisation as part of their um, continuum or guide. And the reason being because there was no odd evidence about actually what critical colonisation meant. Um, so they actually don't use that terminology. It's just colonisation now um, and contamination. And we've adopted that. But again, we, we only adopt what we know and what evidence we're given. So uh, I would recommend and that actually you have a look at that wound healing con um, infection continuum and use that one. There was just no odd evidence about what critical contamination actually meant or looked like. Do topical antimicrobial irrigation solutions effectively destroy biofilms? How are they best used? Gosh, I'm being tested tonight. Antimicrobial irrigation solutions, there are some that are very effective against biofilms and because they break down that extracellular, extracellular casing in a nutshell. Um, I'm not going to mention them all, but there are some out there. I would say you use them like the two-week rule, okay? If you're suspecting biofilms, recurrent local infections, or certainly systemic uh, and spreading infections, use them, okay? How are they best used? How they are recommended to be used? There are some solutions that you leave, uh, you would actually um, put the solution onto the wound bed and leave it on uh, in impregnated gauze, soaked in gauze, for uh, five minutes, some 10, and some just for two, or even one minute. Um, but they have to, you know, use them as recommended. They have to come in, top, in contact with those microorganisms for a certain period. But very much, I think, not just using antiseptics, just really good debridement and cleansing is, is a good way as well. But certainly if it's around infection, the antiseptics are good as, you know, very effective. But again, use them like antimicrobials, two week rule and review. How often would you take photograph of a wound that's not healing? Again, it's, it's all down to your local uh, policy. Um, if it's non-healing, we don't take, you know, some areas will take a wound um, image every time. We normally will say if it's not healing, if it's deteriorating, we take an image straight away. Whether it was two days before or a week before, we would take an image. If it's static, we would normally take an image probably every two weeks, anything between two and four weeks. If you've got necrotic tissue on the wound bed and there is an odour, will topical antimicrobials work? Um, they're not as effective, no. Um, I would say you've got to remove that devitalised tissue. Any, whether it's necrotic, slough, eschar, you've got to remove it. And it's normally that that's causing the odour. It's the devitalised tissue. Yes, it's also equally the type of microorganism. So if there's some anaerobic bacteria in there, that will give that classic odour. Um, but normally that's in there because that devitalised tissue's there. 
and if that devitalized tissue, slough necrotic tissue is there, then it's a little bit like in an analogy, um, if you don't remove that S-score in necrotic tissue, it's like putting your antimicrobial literally on a wall. It can't penetrate, it can't work as effectively. Let's remove that, that, that wall, that brick wall, and allow the antimicrobial to do its job. Gosh, last question. Do antimicrobials work on colonization? My question is, why would you want an antimicrobial on a colonized wound? Because normally colonized wounds are moving along the healing continuum, as you saw on that image I showed you. They're not normally causing a problem to the host. If they were, then, you know, um, I, I would, um, look at maybe introducing it but if there is no factors suggesting that the wound is not healing or the wound is deteriorating or, or or any other factors then i would just say leave well alone so this concludes the seminar i hope you found it interesting and i'd like to take this opportunity to thank bsm medical for their support of this event uh, BSM Medical have a wide range of wound assessment tools. So again, you know, I'm a big believer. Let's use the evidence and tools out there. Let's talk m between ourselves and really share good practice. And their contact details are on the screen. I hope that this has helped you gain a better understanding of treating wound infection in just a short period of time.